one of the most requested videos I've had lately is for Blades in the Dark, and I'm going to do that in this video. The video is going to have a three-part organization. Right now, the first part is going to be a little introduction, talking about not only Blades in the Dark, but the other materials that I'm going to use, or at least that I anticipate using, to put together my adventure. That's the first part of this video. If you're interested in the kind of behind-the-scenes thought process that goes into choosing a rule set, deciding how to support it, and setting up an adventure, you'll want to watch this part of the video as well. The sort of middle part of the video, I'll talk a little bit more specifically about some of the rules of Blades in the Dark and get into more detail about the ways in which this particular system is both rather well suited for solo play and some of the challenges that it poses for soloists and also highlight there what rules I'm going to be overlooking or abstracting even further to make the solo experience enjoyable. And then the third part of the video will be the adventure that I set up, just the gameplay, without too much commentary about the other choices. I've decided to try to separate out the video this way so that people who are interested mostly in gameplay can get right to that, and those that are interested in more of the behind-the-scenes decision-making can start right here. So decision-making. Well, I had a lot of requests for Blades in the Dark, and I have not done any kind of urban RPG, uh, urban fantasy, um, any of that, I don't think, on the channel. There might have been, now that I think about it, there may have been something that had, at least an urban setting, uh, pretty sure Silent Legions might have had that, or maybe that was a university setting. It's hard to remember. Somebody might remind me. But I haven't done or really talked about the concept of urban fantasy in on the channel. And I think one of the things that is of note and of interest, interest to me in doing that is the fact that you have a close quarters. If you're really talking about a city or even a large town, you have some decisions to make about whether you're going to be focusing on a location of close-knit buildings that you're traveling building to building in, or your scale is slightly larger where you're within a city and going to different districts of the city and the Blades in the Dark world comes with a city and various districts. And to some extent, I think I will be picking up at least some of the larger concepts of that and the themes behind the uh, areas of the city in this world. As we look here at the city map and some of the landmarks and the districts that we get described here and the basic themes and concepts. So perhaps the adventure that I'm going to run is going to be traveling from district to district in that sense. But getting back to the concept of the of the urban fantasy, the city itself is a character or should become a character in this type of setting, even more so than terrain might be impacting in if one thinks of a traditional outdoor fantasy adventure or even within a dungeon crawl, the various things that might happen like a lava pit or whatever, those tend to be obstacles and or impediments or perhaps atmospheric to some extent. But I think of urban fantasy as the city itself being a character in the story and very important to generating narrative and to generating atmosphere as well as thematic flow. So that's one that's one thing. The second thing is my own I guess bias you could say toward liking cities. I'm from a city. I am a city girl at heart. I've only ever really spent my life in cities except for very very small portions of my life and even then actually technically I was in smaller cities but my city is New York City and so when when you're from New York City most things seem smaller than that. So in my imagination, in my envisioning a city, to some extent, I'm envisioning a very, very, very large city. And then the districts within that still by any stretches are pretty large. And maybe by many stretches are actually cities unto themselves. The other thing about both urban fantasy and the Blades in the Dark in particular is the concept that there are 
NPCs in the city who can be very well known to the characters. There can be long histories of relationships between your character and NPCs. And we're going to see how that gets picked up here and in fact is generated by Blades in the Dark such that for the soloist, it can be useful because you can already be starting with a web of connection and a web of narrative connection between your character and the guy that works in the store that's selling the thing that you need, for example. That there tends to be a lot of history and history as the present in urban fantasy. And here in particular with Blades in the Dark and this system as it is set up, the other thing that becomes part of the play is the fact that you are belonging to a group or a crew of people. And indeed, that crew has its own character sheet, and I will show that. So one of the challenges for the soloist is that it doesn't really work so well to do Blades in the Dark with just, say, one character. And I've talked in many videos about the fact that in doing solo adventuring, it's easier for me to just stick with one character, maybe two. Oftentimes, I'll have those characters be in search of another character to try and kind of drive the narrative, but to have a whole party of adventurers or in this lingo to have a whole um, group that belongs to a, a crew or a faction gets to be a bit much. Yet to experience Blades in the Dark at it, as it is meant to be, one needs to do that. So I will talk a little bit about that and you'll see that in the adventure that I set up that there is in fact a crew there's a crew sheet that is abstracted to be the type of um, faction that the individual characters are from. And I'll probably, I think I've drawn up three, three different characters that I will be working with when we get to the gameplay. So Blades in the Dark is going to be the foundation. But in addition to that, I want to bring in a couple of other things. And I recently purchased, well, let me just go back to say that I purchased this quite some time ago. I believe I purchased it just from an online retailer. I, it's widely available. It I will show the publication credits here and the date, the um, copyright date of this is uh, 2017. So I purchased this for a while ago, but never have not yet done any type of video on it. A more recent purchase, a very more recent purchase, is the Stygian Library, a dungeon for bibliophiles. And this is, let me show you the credits here. Interesting, it's very, very small, uh, written by Emmy Cave Girl Allen. And that is the colophon here on the copyright page. This is of interest to me because if you watch my channel, you know that I very much love libraries and books, of course, and the idea that within this city there is a library that is somehow the goal or the maybe even obstacle for my crew. That just came to me that I wanted that to be the case, that they are going to be attempting to get to this library or somehow it's going to be part of the narrative. So I'm going to be using this pretty extensively to develop the library at the very least as an urban character in my story. I've also got, I bought this I, a little while ago, Dark Streets, Darker Secrets, a rules light street and sorcery role-playing game with an old school spirit. And here is the author credit. I bought this a while ago, never played it, but realized that there are a lot of random tables here in the back, urban tables, and I'm going to be using some of them somehow, I think, to supplement other things and give me some kind of urban-related tables to roll on. So that's going to come into play. And then, of course, my standard array of solo tools. I've got the Destiny Check Roll and Chaos Roll table from something that I recently did a video on. And then my, just the kind of range of random tables. I got my general percentile table. These come from Scarlet Heroes. And this is another one, all just different 
ways, depending on how the narrative strikes me, of bringing in randomness. In addition to all of that, I discovered after I had decided on Blades in the Dark that there's actually a solo supplement for Blades in the Dark. The solo supplement is called Alone in the Dark, and I did not, I bought it from our drive through RPG. I had to not print the first page because it's like super toner intensive. It's all black, basically. And then it also inadvertently omitted the designer's name, but I've put that up in the title so you can see the proper credit to this. This, These are solo rules, and they are a few pages long. I will go into them a little bit more in detail in a moment, but it gives an introduction and some basic D6 probability charts. The, the main, the meat of this system are these game icons and the way that it's interesting. It's like a visual oracle in a sense. So you can say here, it's he's got a D66 roll and it's 3D6, red as a three-digit number, and you'll roll on these icons really when you're looking for narrative direction, and you'll get a number, and it will correspond to a picture. I think this is pretty cool, and then you're basically going to interpret the picture. This is similar, I suppose, like people use Rory's Story Cubes, and I've said in other videos for various reasons, I don't, I had those, my kids had them as a game. I, I just never liked them, but this this interests me. Presumably, the iconography is tied in, at least generally speaking, thematically to the game. Now, of course, how you interpret this is going to be very much based in your story. I mean, any of these things. So I'm going to give this a whirl and use this. Now, back to the probability chart, because I will be using this as much as I can to try to keep within the rules of the Blades in the Dark system when I'm doing probability roles in addition to my general oracles that I use. What this is, is it shows you the, it basically takes an oracle chart and it fits it into the blade system. So if you are asking a question and deciding the answer to that question, so if the answer is going to be unlikely to determine whether or not that happened, you would do your 1d6 roll and then take the answer from that and read it off of this. So in that particular case, if something was unlikely and we got, we did the roll, we happened to get a four or five, so we got the yes. But and you can see, obviously, if the answer to the question was likely, we're now rolling 3d6. Now, in this particular case, we essentially got the same roll because we would be choosing a four, but potentially you could get a bigger roll or uh, more likely to get a critical uh, role, which is a yes and something else. So you're answering, you're asking the question in the form of, you know, a yes. So we're outside, there are, it's midnight, it's foggy, there's a sentry walking back and forth. What's the chance of us being spotted? Well, we factor everything in and we figure the chances are, well, we don't know, it's 50 50. So we're going to roll 2d6 on that. We happen to get a yes on that. But if we thought, well, it's really unlikely, you know, we are a character with a high stealth value, blah, 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 then um, it's unlikely, or I should say it is likely that we will uh, succeed in hiding, then we would be rolling the 3d6 and using it that way. So I'll be picking this up. This kind of replaces the fortune roll. In Blades in the Dark, there is something that's almost akin to giving the GM a, a role themselves as an oracle. And it's basically said here, the fortune role is a tool the GM can use to disclaim decision-making. And you could be using it if you want to make a determination about a situation that's kind of off to the side and there's no real way of assessing um, rather than just random. You can use the fortune role and use these types of criteria to either add or take away dice in the role, or when an outcome is really just completely uncertain and there's no specific role that applies, and this is kind of how we would be picking it up and using it, you can do the same thing, adding a dice if you think a particular trait is involved, or adding a dice for a major advantage, or taking away 
and then these are the results. Now, as you'll see later on when we start our adventure, I'm going to be picking up some version of this when we investigate the and create basically through our investigation the Stygian Library. Because what I want to do, rather than just deciding I'm going to roll on all this information, is to have it tie into the Blades rules a little bit, such that um, we're going to determine how successful our investigation is going to be. And then, based on that role, how much information we'll be able to get about the library. And that will come into play more thematically when we get into the actual adventure. My three characters, I've chosen a leech. This is an, has an alchemist special ability. He's a saboteur and technician. And per the rules, I have given him some connection, a positive connection to a corpse thief and a negative connection to a priestess. And we have the whisper. This is an arcane adept and channeler. He has a special ability to study occult rituals or create new ones with a positive connection to a possessor ghost and a negative connection to a witch. And finally, Cutter, the dangerous and intimidating fighter. He's a ghost fighter. He can imbue his hands, melee weapons, or tools with spirit energy, gains potency in combat versus the supernatural. So again, a theme here. And I didn't, I see I did not fill in yet his friends or uh, connections, his positive or negative connections there. So we've got these three characters. We've got a ghost theme. I know that somehow a library is going to be the object of the attempt, whatever that attempt is, to go somewhere, to steal something, to find something. I don't know yet. I know that I'm going to be bringing in some random tables from here, basically working with the blades in the dark system. And at this point, that's pretty much all I know. Let's spend a bit of time talking about some of the rules and mechanics of Blades in the Dark, specifically as they're going to relate to how we are going to use this in solo work. I should say that I have not played Blades in the Dark at all, either in a regular kind of session or even in setting up something solo myself. I, I haven't done it yet. I've read the book. I've thought about it a little bit, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the rules as we look here again at the credits and the copyright page, but I actually don't know how well this is going to be suited to solo. It's extremely well suited toward a narrative kind of game because it explicitly talks about and is has rules that support conversation. And the author of the book goes into detail in many places. Here's just one, making the game your own. Role-playing is at its essence an expressive act. Everything in this book exists to help you and your friends express yourself by creating collaborative social fiction about a crew of daring scoundrels. And this message of the co-creation of a narrative, here's the core system, the first thing you hear is the conversation, is a very refreshing approach to a rule set and to role playing where the author is saying, in essence, baked into my rules is the fact that this is going to be a co-created story and a live story. So in that regard, you'd think, well, it would be helpful for solo work because in essence, what solo role playing is doing is simply just using RPG rule sets as a tool to create a story, as opposed to using words as tools to create a story. It is using words in this way to help you create a story through game mechanics and things of that nature. So it's a different type of living story, basically. I would say that solo RPGing is closest to the concept of creating some kind of living story, more much more so than it is to mimicking or trying to pretend to be a tabletop session with people sitting around the table and a GM. 
I get comments and questions on the channel about this. Well, why do you do this? And it, you know, do you think you're trying to do something that's just like an RPG or more, more phrased like, well, I wouldn't do that. I would just get together with friends and, and have an evening of playing an RPG to which I would say, absolutely. This is something different. This is something that's not trying to mimic that, but rather using the, the world that is created in a rule set and the rules themselves to tell a live story and to watch a story unfold. In any case, getting back to Blades in the Dark and a little bit away from that, that commentary. In a weird way, because of the fact that this conversation is baked into this rule set, I, I, I wonder how well it's going to work. So let's talk a little bit about some of the actual die rolling and the mechanics and what we're going to see here. The main role that we're going to see in our story is the action role. And there are a list of actions. They are delineated at various points in the book. And we'll look here at the first one. The book, the book itself is very thorough. It's not necessarily always organized the way that's intuitive to me, but the actions are delineated here. So a tune is one action. Um, and it's described here, when you attune, you open your mind to the ghost field or channel nearby electroplasmic energy through your body. And then it gives the kinds of questions that a GM might ask and some examples of this. Now, this will help you in deciding, it's basically like an attribute, what you're going to use to roll. And you are selecting a number of dice based on your skill level. So for example, getting back to the whisper, here are the various actions. There are 12 of them, and they are grouped into three attributes, insight, prowess, and resolve. And we'll talk about that in a minute. You see these pips filled in. Each pip is going to give you a D6 that you can roll if you're attempting an action with that attribute. So if the Whisper is attempting to tinker, he can roll two D6. When you do the roll, you take the high number and then that becomes the value that you're reading for the result. The result is going to have a full success, a critical success, a partial success, or some type of failure depending on both the number and something called the position that is happening when the roll is made. So the GM is going to decide the position, and of course, in this case, that's you also, in terms of how risky a situation is, or is it a desperate situation, is it a risky situation, or is it a controlled situation? And the, we're instructed by the rules that this really refers to the likelihood that something is going to happen. So this becomes um, implicated in if you have a success that is for an action that is risky versus a success that is for an action that is desperate or controlled, you may have actually more or less benefit from that. So it's another way of modulating the situation that in the actual way the game is played, a player is going to state uh, what the action rating they want to use, and then the GM is going to kind of put the parameters onto that. You, of course, are going to need to do both. Now, you'll notice that there are many, with our characters here, uh, many of these skills that have no pips filled in. So if the Whisper is trying to hunt, for example, he's got no pips filled in. He will still roll 2d6 in this case, but be forced to take the lower of the two numbers there. So when you have nothing filled in, that is how you do that. And you can see, for example, with this roll, that would be quite the penalty. And if you have one filled in, you simply roll one and you take that value. So that's how the pips work and that is how the action role works. These attributes, the insight, prowess, and resolve are used when one is trying to resist something and it's called the resistance role. And what you do there is you will tally the number of pips total in that section. So for example, if we were trying to 
resist something like a spell, for example, and we're trying to resist it using our resolve as the whisper, we have three pips filled in. We would thus get to roll three d6s, choose the highest roll, and then read that number again in light of the position. And I'm going to get into the position examples in a minute. If we were using insight somehow to try to resist something, we would actually get to roll four d6 because we have a total number of four pips filled in under the insight position. And again, we would simply be reading the high number here. A critical success is going to be two sixes. Two sixes, or I should say two or more sixes, is a critical success that is in excess of some kind of success. And if you're rolling something where you're rolling two numbers and you're taking the lower result because you have no pips filled in, you cannot get a crit. So if you happen to roll two sixes in the context of rolling with no pips, you simply would get a success. There would be no critical in that situation. Let's talk a little bit more about this concept of position vis-a-vis -vis the action roll and what it actually means. If you're making an action roll on some level, according to the rules by definition, it really is at least a risky situation or else you don't need to be making an action roll. You would just do the thing. So this rule set operates under the principle of if the answer is yes, you just do it. Otherwise, you roll the dice. However, there is nevertheless a provision made for a position that's called controlled, which is defined as you're acting on your own terms, that you have perhaps a distinct advantage, and you're acting in that regard. So an example of that might be you are trying to decipher a magical scroll and realize that you know the language of magic in which it is written or something like that. If you do your role there and you get this one, which is going to be a failure, here it's going to be a falter. So you could still have the opportunity to press on by doing it as a risky opportunity because it had originally started out as controlled. If you were say, trying to decipher the same scroll, but it was a risky situation, meaning that perhaps the environment of the scroll was a place that you had broken into and you weren't supposed to be there and people were looking for you or whatever, and you received that one, and that would then mean that things are going badly. You could suffer a harm or a complication directly could occur from the result of it. And then you would be ending up in a desperate situation and you would lose the opportunity of the risky situation. If you started out in a desperate situation, say you were trying to decipher this scroll while the magic building in within which it was housed was disintegrating around you as it was under a fire attack from somebody, then a one is the worst possible outcome, and then some severe harm would occur and a serious complication would occur. Thus, the same die roll, depending on the circumstance, can have different outcomes. And the same, of course, would be true for some type of success or in the middle of the road, even a in a controlled situation, the four or five is a hesitate. You might get to retry in a different way. The four or five here in the risky situation is that some type of complication may occur, even though you do have some success. And here, the four or the five is that there's a serious complication that arises, even though you're able to do the thing that you wanted to do. And maybe the thing you wanted to do has a reduced effect. So perhaps to continue with this example, in a desperate situation, you would decipher the scroll, but the scroll would not have been the elixir that you wanted it to be, or the thing that you were actually seeking. And the final part of the rules I'm going to talk about has to do with the resistance roll and also this concept of stress and trauma. And all of this has to do with what happens when things go badly. There are not, there's no HP per se in this game. There are no hit points in this regard, but you can take on 
what's called stress and ultimately trauma if you continually fail at things. And eventually the outcome of too much trauma is, is basically you're out and you would be out for that session and then you could come back after the session. But for the purposes of what we're talking about here and kind of a one shot thing, you know, you're just, you're just done basically if you get to the point of trauma. But stress happens first. And the way stress works is through this concept of the resistance role. So I mentioned that there are these three attributes. There are, there's insight, prowess, and resolve. And we saw those on the character sheet. And within those, you can use these to resist various things. So if you wanted to, to take the earlier example, resist some type of negative spell through your willpower, through your mental strain, you um, would have to suffer a certain amount of stress when you resist. So to go back to our whisper example, here is our whisper character, sorry, and this character under the resolve here, I think we're, let's see, we said yes, under resolve has a total of three pips marked. So if he's going to res uh, resist something that way, the first thing that's going to happen is he's going to do this roll. And these are his die rolls. So he is going to get to select the high one, which is going to be the six. To see how much stress he is under for that resistance, what he does is he suffers six stress minus the highest die result. So in this case, with the roll of the six, he actually didn't suffer any stress in resisting. You can see though, however, that having the additional die there is pretty significant. So if he was resisting using something, for example, that he only had two dice for, well, he rolled another six, but say he didn't, say he rolled here the five, he would then suffer one stress for that resistance. He would resist it, but it would be at a cost. And once you get beyond nine stress, you turn into the resistance then becomes trauma. And there are various impacts of trauma that I'm not going to get into here, but there are deleterious uh, effects once you get into trauma. The other point to mention is that you can voluntarily assume negative things in order to aid one of your companions. So for example, for one bonus die on your role, you can get assistance from a teammate. They will take one stress, say how they're going to help you and give you one die. That's the teamwork. And then you can also push yourself, which is voluntarily taking two stress to add another bonus die to your role. There is also something called the Devil's Bargain, which is essentially something that I'm not sure really is going to come into play too much solo, but it's an interesting, it's uh, an interesting little mechanic. I'm not sure how it would work when you're playing by yourself, but in essence, what you can do is the GM or another player can offer you a bonus die if you accept one of these one of these situations, sacrificing money or taking some type of damage or harm. Harm is a long-term uh, debility that happens when something negative happens and there's lesser harm, moderate harm, and severe harm. And the impact of these things is perhaps losing a dice or having a reduced effect from a future role. And if you're really impacting, if you're impacted by the severe harm, you can't actually do anything yourself. You have to have help for someone else or push yourself. So it forces you to have more and more stress. How that is going to be tracked in a solo play, we will have to see. The other and final thing I'm going to mention is the notion of progress in the game. A progress clock is a circle divided into segments. See example at right. You draw a progress clock when you need to track an ongoing effort against an obstacle. And you could have a four segment, a six segment, or an eight segment. And then the effect level of the action is going to determine how many segments you tick in until something is completed. So it allows you to 
figure out if you're doing something over a long period of time. And I'll have to see how I develop this based on the story. But if you were over a period of time, for example, trying to uh, investigate the schedule of a sentry, for example, passing in front of a building and you're gathering more and more information as well as other things are happening, that might be track. Sorry about that. I ran out of space. What I was saying is that the number of ticks that you get to make or the GM gets to make on that clock is dependent upon the effect level. So this gets back to this gets to this um, situation here where you are the GM is going to decide the effect level using this criteria below. So you if the effect is going to be great, then you get three ticks for whatever amount of progress. If it's going to be a standard, you get two and limited effect, you're going to get one. And this has to do with again, the impact basically of what you're trying to do. Doing this solo, I'm not sure how, whether this will become just kind of artificial bookkeeping or whether it will actually be useful. I don't know. You know, we'll just have to see how it goes. But that um, that's just a summary of some of the major rules of Blades in the Dark that I wanted you to be familiar with as I understand them. And now we're going to just talk about the setting up of the, the adventure and get into a little bit of the gameplay demo. What I want to do is I want to utilize the world that John Harper creates in this Blades in the Dark, this city, this cold, foggy city of Duskval, aka Duskwall or the Dusk. It's industrial in its development. Imagine a world like ours during the second industrial revolution of the 1870s. It's something like a mashup of Venice, London, and Prague. It's crowded with row houses, twisting streets, and crisscrossed crisscrossed with hundreds of little waterways and bridges. I have some sense of this, having been fortunate enough to have been to at least two of the three, that is to say London and Prague. I've never been to Venice, but I have some sense of the feel, and the book here is illustrated very nicely with black and white art that gives a sense of this crushingly close world and a kind of cold and dank place, a very dark place. The city is also a fantasy. The world is in perpetual darkness and haunted by ghosts, a result of the cataclysm that shattered the sun and broke the gates of death a thousand years ago. The cities of the empire are each encircled by crackling lightning towers to keep out the vengeful spirits and twisted horrors of the deathlands. To power these massive barriers, the titanic metal ships of the leviathan hunters are sent out from Doskval to extract electroplasmic blood from massive demonic terrors upon the ink tark void sea. You're in a haunted Victorian era city trapped inside a wall of lightning powered by demon blood. Well, that is fairly specific. And then the author of their rule set goes on to say uh, in a more generalized meta way. The point of all this is to create a pressure cooker environment for our criminal escapades so that the there is pressure to get things done in the city, that everything the players choose to do has consequences for their characters and shifts the balance of power around the city, driving the action for a sandbox style of role-playing game. And I mentioned earlier, I have chosen my characters already and not including character creation at all as a part of this video. This is not, as I said, a teaching or learning video about the system. I did it. It's a pretty easy way to create characters and there are other videos out there if you're interested in actually seeing that. I chose to work up a leech who is a tinkerer, alchemist, or saboteur. A 
Whisper, who is an arcane adept, and I also chose a Lurk, a steady, stealthy infiltrator. I mentioned too that my crew is going to be the shadows, that is thieves and spies, and that somehow there's going to be a library involved here. And now I'm going to turn to the primary source material. Sorry about that. Primary source material in the back here. We're in this city. And the first thing I'm going to do is just figure out where we are. And the districts are conveniently labeled for us. There are seven different districts. So let's just give this a roll and see where, where we are. If I roll an eight, I guess I will choose. How about we say it? How about we put it that way? If we, if I roll an eight, I'm going to choose. Otherwise it's going to be just, just a random thing. And we rolled a two. So we're going to be in, let's get this. Can we see this here? We're going to be in the Lost District, a once wealthy area ravaged by plague, then abandoned to the Deathlands when the second lightning barrier was built. It contains many lost treasures for the foolhardy to seek out. That's pretty cool. And here we are over here on this map. Interestingly, for two of my three characters, I chose luxury was the vice that I chose for them. And as part of the character creation, you choose a vice. We'll just go to this and I'll explain how they identify what that means. Every scoundrel is enthralled to some vice or another, which they indulge to add with, to deal with stress. Choose a vice from the list and describe it, etc. I happen to choose luxury for two of them. So what we've learned is that we are in a section here that was once luxurious and is now fallen into disarray. But somehow we're going to tie in this concept of the lost luxury and the fact that there are lots of treasures here. Now, I did not do yet what I have been, what I say I do in all my videos, which is to assign everybody some random trinket. I'm going to do that now and then develop the story of these three people and their crew of thieves. But instead of a trinket roll, in keeping with blades, I'm going to go to this solo, the solo icons here, and I'm going to roll two icons for each character. And what I roll up, I'm going to interpret not necessarily as trinkets, but perhaps more memories or history. I'm not sure. Something is going to be, we'll see. We'll see how we do it. And uh, we're going to start with our Cutter character. This is just random. He was on top. Cutter character, he's a devil hunter, and he is the fighter. So what we're going to do is we're going to roll these dice, and I'm going to read them in the order of the color of the um, etching inside. So we're going to go alphabetically. We're going to go um, black, green, white in this order to get our number. And i got to get my dice tray. I need to use my dice tray. Black, green, white. So we rolled a 521 for him. And his first, first memory or item, well, it's this thing. It is this thing. Let's, uh, let's retain that in our mind and get a second one. And the second one is going to be 464. 464. Remember, this is our fighter character. He's also a devil hunter. 464. And 464 is this. Mm -hmm. This, this and this. Well, this to me says he's a devil hunter. He's a fighter. He, has, he is carrying with him the memory of an unsuccessful or an almost successful attack on or capturing of some devil or some haunting figure that that got away from him. So his motivation, he is motivated by vengeance against this character. And he is, there's going to be a specific character uh, that exists in the world, this devil character that he unsuccessfully attacked in the past. And this is going to be, this is going to be his particular backstory. All right, next up is going to be the Whisper character. 
This is a dark scholar. He is an adept and a channeler. And let's see, let's see what we get when we roll for him. We uh, got 515. We're on this page. Well, this is this is 515, whatever that might be. And give another roll. And we will go with 524. 524. This. This. And that. Not really suggesting a whole lot to me. What did I say? 515, 524. Whisper, he's a dark scholar. This is giving me absolutely nothing. So I'll think about it. Maybe you guys can say in the comments what you would choose for this in the context of a dark scholar. I've really got nothing. So I'm just going to write down these numbers, 515 and 524. Come back to that later. Next up and last, we have our, this is the crew sheet. We've got the leech. The leech is a witch. And this is a saboteur, a technician. Oh, I do have little standees I'm going to use for everybody. I'll show that to you in a minute. All right, let's see what our witch character has by way of perhaps a memory or some such. I realize as I'm doing this role, I could have perhaps rearranged my dice to see if something else was suggesting itself with the other guy. Maybe I'll do that. But we got a 232 here. And, you know, when you're doing this kind of stuff, obviously, well, whatever, we're making everything up. But if something's not working, what sometimes what I'll try to do is keep the same numbers that I rolled, but um, switch them around a little bit. 232. So what are we here with a witch? Well, that's some kind of a blade or something. Perhaps it looks magical in some way or arcane. All right, 232. And we have 343. 343. 343. Well, that, that looks like a poisonous mushroom to me. Poisonous mushroom, some kind of a, some kind of a, a blade, a magical or arcane blade. So she being a witch, well, we're just going to say that she has, uh, she is a master of the dark arts and she is deadly. She is deadly and she perhaps has some kind of um, special access to poisons, to corruption, to, I don't know, uh, if she's going to be in a place that seems in some way decaying or decrepit, somehow she's going to get some kind of benefit from that. She's connected to perhaps the undercity of this, of this, of this city. She is perhaps connected to death in some way, if there's a necromancer character, something like that. This is what is suggesting to me here. She is definitely um, a, associated with these types of things. So that is the backstory of the leech. Moving back to the whisper, well, 515 and what did I say, 524. Um, let's look at 425, just to see if we get anything more suggestive on 425. Perhaps 425, some type of, well, originally like a viaduct or a uh, uh, something in a city, but of course we are already in a city, something that has to do with crossing or going from one place to another. The, uh, again, this is the Dark Scholar, and let's see what was 515 again with that. 515. Actually, I'm remembering now one of them had that. I think it had that kind of, yeah. There's a bird. All right. I'm going to go with some suggestion of movement or I don't want to say transportation is too technical, but transport of perhaps a different realm. Something, there's something here that is suggesting to me that this dark scholar has access to another place. Perhaps the Dark Scholar knows of a lore of another area and has the ability to travel 
something with travel, flight, the bird, these man-made, um, they could perhaps be either viaducts or some type of uh, canal. Again, we had the suggestion from the author of the system to think of Venice as one of the kinds of city urban areas. So this, this dark scholar is going to be connected in some way with something to do with transport, air, whatever, and maybe this will come up and maybe it won't. So those are the little bit more of the backstory of our people here. And now we're going to kind of figure out uh, what they're trying to do vis-a-vis -vis this library that I know is going to be part of their story. The Devil Hunter and the Witch meet secretly amid the decay of the once luxurious district. Burning remains of the palace are all around them, and the dust, when moved away, reveals golden and magical objects half buried in the crumbling stone. The Shadow's crew has failed to sufficiently guard the library, and as a result, the ward, which has protected its internal magic, has severed. The barrier between the natural and supernatural realms, guarded by this magic books in the library, has broken. This breach must be stopped. The reward for doing so will be the most sacred tome of all given to the crew to bring back to the lost district to restore it to its former glory. A dust-covered sewer entrance is the way underground to the library. There aren't a lot of random tables in Blades in the Dark, but we're going to make use of as much of this as we can to help out a little here. So. We've got some information about the streets. We will roll on, well, let's see the mood of the street. I mean, this is just a D6 table, so it's not gonna give us much quiet or refined. My feeling is that this is a, a nighttime encounter. There's fog. We can say it's quiet. Perhaps it is the absence of people at this late hour and the fact that not a lot of people continue to live in this area. And let's get some, Whoops, let's get some uh, sights, sounds, and smells going here. We'll just do this like this. Well, we got mist, fog, frost. We have some bells, clock chimes, or harbor horns, and uh, damp wood decay refuse. So this is suggesting, again, a, uh, an area that perhaps once was filled with activity is no longer because either it's nighttime or it's abandoned or both. We don't really actually know what use we, what use this area was in particular. So we will see it was an area of vice, manufacture and vice. So an industrial area we're in, whoops. And, um, where are we right now? We are, where are we? We are in a narrow lane that is part of a tight alley. So we, uh, and some final details here on the outside. I, I got the dice tray, but of course I got to learn how to use it. We've got some metal structures here and some clockwork mechanisms around, but the point being we are outside in an alley there's the sewer there. I think the suggestion is such that we're going to need to go into the sewer, open the sewer, make our way toward the library. I think that seems pretty clear. Question is, now we can ask, what uh, is this, is the sewer likely to be easily opened? I guess is the question. Well, no. I think the question is really, is, is there any kind of magic ward on the sewer? That, that's where we're going to go here as a question initially to see the answer to that. And I'm just going to give that a 50-50 because it truly is, we don't know. We're just starting out. I've got no, I've got, I've got no, no sense of what that would be. So just to move back to this, we do a 2d6 roll because we got the 50-50 here, and we are getting definitely the, the no. So there's no magic ward here. We're just going to be able to open it up with a bit of strength. We don't need to do a roll on opening this up, but we are going to need to do a roll to ask the question, what are, well, let's see, is it 
is it is there going to be is it going to be an easy passage is it going to be an easy passage through this sewer to the library in other words are we going to just sail through and not meet anyone or have any difficulty what is the what is the chance of that oh it's pretty unlikely so we're going to roll the 1d6 here to say um is it going to be an easy way and the answer is four well yes but but Okay, it's going to be easy, but something negative is going to happen. Well, what negative is going to happen? And here, we're going to go, I think we're going to roll on this. We're going to go and roll, roll on this. We're going to roll on this. What negative is going to happen? And we will take these dice. Let me get the proper ones. All right, we'll just roll this way. So reading them in color order. Um, what's the complication we're rolling here for the complication what's the complication going to be we're going to read uh, black blue and white 524 the complication that we're going to encounter is this thing again <laughs> all right this thing, you may recall if you've actually watched this whole video or the earlier portion of it, this thing came up as a role. I even have to go back and see. I'll put the I'll put it down in the credits by the or the titles by the time you're watching this when I edit it. This came up as one of our something to do with the backstory of one of our characters. I didn't know what to make of it. I did another role, but it's come up again. And that is telling me that that particular character, well, perhaps this is a mirror. Perhaps this is a mirror with something dripping. Perhaps something in the person's future is going to be in danger. Something negative is going to happen to this character as we travel in the sewers. So we're traveling in the sewers and something negative is going to happen to this character. And what negative is going to happen? Well, Let's just do another roll. Sticking with this, sticking with this solo thing. I just cannot get this going. Sticking with this, we've got uh, black, blue, and white. One fifty-five. What do we get? One fifty-five. Yes, this is going. Whoop. Yes, this is going to suggest to me some time space continuum that this character is going to be caught up in a maelstrom of perhaps this is that devil i got to figure out let's see who this character which character was that all right yeah it's not the it's not the devil thing it's the it's the dark scholar it's this this travel thing that we that we were talking about earlier that the backstory of our dark scholar is something to do with transportation, access to different realms, something of this nature. Now, we did get a clear yes that we are going to make it to the library, but we the complication has to do with some sort of new of of the swirling thing being that the dark scholar is being drawn into and I'm going to say that maybe what this means is, well, we do get to the library. Perhaps the library itself is in a different realm or has been already overtaken and corrupted in some way. So it's not the library we were expecting to get to. It is a different library. It is a more dangerous place, perhaps. It is the risks associated with being there are higher. And the way that this would function in the context of the story is that we would be under more desperate circumstances that i would allow this to in the rule set of blades in the dark influence the position of where we are and i mentioned earlier in the video that one of the things that is useful and easy about blades in the dark is the heavy emphasis on narrative but what makes it challenging for the soloist is to kind of figure out the GM portion of it because it's so narrative based. And you can see earlier in the video, I talked about how the emergent narrative of your story could help you with some of these decisions. And we can see this right here. So moving on in this story, I would set as my default 
always the position to be desperate. And that would be directly coming out of this instance that just happened. So that's one example of how random tables can lead to an emergent narrative that then comes back to influence the rule set that you are using. Of course, it influences the story too, because in this case, we've got the yes, you reached the library, but no, it's not quite the library you thought it was going to be. Now, I had said at the beginning of the video, and I would stick to this, that I wanted to use this Stygian library dungeon for bibliophiles to create my library. I haven't yet done anything with this. So in a sense, rolling up this library can simply proceed as it would have been, yet the impact of being there is going to have to be more dangerous. And in these rules, if there is an opportunity for more danger, I would go in that direction because of the situation that we are in. Again, all coming out of the the random rolling and the connection of the random rolling to mechanisms within the rules. And ultimately, when you're trying to do some kind of solo RPG, that's, I think, a way that helps. Taking the randomness, making a story out of it, and then the implications of that story become something more that can guide the kind of GM portion of it to give you a direction for decisions where you don't simply have to rely on a totally random role, whether it's just a 50-50 role or whether it's something like you're using from a system. So I now have my, my party led by the, the dark scholar who is being drawn into a, another realm with his, with his compadres because I'm not, not going to split them up. That's, it's already challenging to have more than one character, but the, the witch, the devil hunter, and the dark scholar, all of their fates are intertwined. So they are going to be drawn into this other version of the dark library than they were anticipating. It's going to be more dangerous and the tasks that they have in front of them are going to be more challenging to accomplish.